As always, our show is sponsored by Memoria Press. You can find our curriculum at memoriapress.com. Welcome to Classical Etc., a show that dives into the philosophy, culture, and heart of classical education. You're in the studio with Shane Saxon. Welcome to another episode of Classical Etc. I'm sitting with three of my friends, Paul Schaefer, a special guest, Dr. Carol Reynolds, and Martin Cothran. And on today's episode, we're going to talk about the arts, because that's what Dr. Carol loves talking about. Before we get there, it's actually our habit on this show, I guess we call it a show, to talk about what we're reading right now. So, Dr. Carol, what have you been reading recently? Well, <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't prep you for this question because no, no, I it's wanted good. your no, honest I'm, reaction. I'm, personally, I'm reading a book on the the taking of Berlin in 1945, oh, which well. is uh, you know, so it's, it's history, nonfiction. Yeah, yeah, because I mean, Berlin's a place I know well, a city I love, mm. and you can't read too much about Berlin. And Berlin's just an extraordinary place. And you want history, you go to Berlin, you look at it. That's what I'm personally reading, and I've been here reading a great deal of your books because oh. of working on a project with you all right now. So I just finished for the first time in my life, The Moffats. Oh. And I'm reading Bronze Bow. Wow. And there's all these books that I missed in my yeah. childhood. They weren't they weren't what we saw back then. Mm. So that's what I'm reading. Mara, what are you reading right now? I am reading a couple things. I'm reading uh, The Peloponnesian War by Thucydides, which I read in college, I think. And since we just recently taught it at our uh, at Memorial College, uh, I wanted to go back and uh, a real nail biter. A real nail biter. Well, it's amazing. You know what amazes me about that book is that they are so modern hmm. in in terms of the way they reason with each other, and the the fact that here you have this ancient civilization, the the first the first real. Uh, uh, Western civilization, and they're appealing to reason, and they're appealing to justice, and all the speeches that occur in this book. These these are the standards by which they live. They're not primitive in any way. You know, is, so is that is that what you mean when you say they're so modern? You just mean they're not primitive? Uh, no, I, I mean they're they're modern Westerners. They're they're they share the ideals and values of Western civilization. I mean, they they invented them basically, but but to see it there so early. And to see this, you know, this dis rational discussion going on so early on in history was what really kind of impressed me. And then I'm also reading uh, Lorna Doone, um, which is a, a, a great little book about um, about a romance between two warring um, clans. And it's, again, a, a book that was written in the mid-early uh, 19th century and a very... Uh, again, a book that you would think would be written a little bit later because it's actually fairly sophisticated. So there's a common theme in your reading right now, which is war. Are you going through an okay time right now? Or are you, do we need uh, to talk about that on the episode? Um, I hadn't thought about it that way, actually. <laughs> I'm reading war too, so. Yeah, so far everyone's reading about war. <laughs> I'm, reading, I'm reading The Return of the King, which is also about war. Um, just finishing that up. Also reading Don Quixote, which in its own way is about war, right? Doing a uh, knight going about and doing his, mm. having his battles. Um, and I've convinced the Memorial Press Book Club to read Don Quixote with me. And so I'm excited for that because I'm going to go back and reread it a second time as soon as I'm done. I've already made that determination. When I'm done, I'm starting over. Nice. I'm two thirds of the way through Wuthering Heights, Aww. basically because it was slandered on this podcast <laughs> a couple of episodes back by Martin and a friend of mine emailed me afterwards and said, how dare you? And so I had to read it to determine <laughs> if I agreed with Martin or my friend. So... We're, we're on do, our way. Do you have, are, do, so are, far, are you I, leaning one way I or enjoy it quite a bit, but I do think the ending is what people have told me is part of what makes it controversial, at mm -hmm. least in terms of the enjoyment factor. But so far, I, I'm i very interested in it. Oh. I, was, I was comparing Bronte's sister to Bronte's sister. Sure. And uh, I think I mentioned somewhere, I don't know if it was, maybe it was here, maybe it was that remark that got me in trouble. I said that, you know, I, I stayed away from Jane Eyre for many years because I had a, a difficult um, experience with her sister, with the with the, Bron the other Bronte sister, and so finally I read Jane Eyre, and I I love Jane Eyre so much that Wuthering Heights d d just didn't seem nearly as good. So far, I prefer Jane Eyre at this point. Yeah, I would agree with that assessment, having finished both books. Dr. Carol, what do you think? Well, no, because I remember reading Wuthering Heights at I can't remember what grade, you know different era there wasn't all of this variety to pull from so 
It was a life changer. Hmm. That and Far From the Madding Crowd are the two books I remember in oh, high sorry. school that really gave me something to, to see beyond myself. Not necessarily cheerful things, obviously, but um, those are the two I remember. What do you, what do you mean, see by, what, what was it well, about Wuthering Heights that, that got you? I have to go back and reread it. Yeah. But you know, I mean, the, when I, I don't want to overdo this, it's not nostalgia, and I don't want to overdo the storytelling of what it was life back then, because back then is, is pretty real to me still, you know. But I, it was a time where you didn't envision getting beyond my life, my neighborhood, my, you know, my public library that was four blocks away was pretty much the end of my, my life, you know. It was a good, good end to have that and walking to where my father had a business and we all worked in it. And, you know, I mean, I just couldn't envision how you ever got from childhood to that world that I thought might be out there. And somehow those books really gave me courage. It's a very dark yeah. interesting, vivid world that she creates with really only two locations, but they're kind of magical a little bit and well, the people in them are so interesting. So I, yeah. I, I see what you mean. And at that age, you know, you don't know what triggers what in a, sure. in a, in mm-hmm. a kid, especially if you aren't bombarded with the visual, you know, and which we weren't. I mean, this is sort of howdy duty time, you know. So if those <laughs> books were, um, they were just key. They were tunnels. They were, they were, they got you away. Yeah, so... On this episode, we have Dr. Carol, who we've never had before, and hopefully maybe we'll have again. But one of the reasons we wanted to talk with you is because you've really dedicated your life to arts and the fine arts and music. You have a PhD in music from University of North Carolina. Is Mm -hmm. that correct? Mm -hmm. And you also lead tours uh, that are about cultural history, correct? Mm -hmm. And then you also just write about appreciating the arts, and I think specifically Russian yeah, the, that's Art basically has, my field. Is your is field? Russian okay. musicology, music history, et cetera. What is it that compelled you to dedicate your life to to this, to this work? Um, okay. And, you make it sound so fancy. Because I don't think when you're going through your stages of your life, you're thinking about dedicating anything. You're just sure. charging ahead. You just did what you liked. <laughs> you're tra- you know, it was like, oh, now what? Now what? Oh, can I do this? Oh, my goodness. This, oh, can, I, can I get that? You know, will this happen? <laughs> oh, no, it's happening. Now what? You know, um, and then you look back and you go, yes. You know? <laughs> <laughs> this austere plan that you had for your life? Yes, it's all was very planned. Yeah, I mean, yeah. trust me. Well, I had dreams, though. And, and. And the arts, I wouldn't have even known what you meant when I was 12 when you said the arts, quite frankly. I played piano. I mean, I took piano. I was a pretty good player, but there weren't a lot of options either, you know, where I was in Roanoke, Virginia. My parents did the best they could find for me. And you know, so the, the things that were inspiring, one was Van Cliburn, because that whole explosion of Van Cliburn going, as I guess he was 19 years old from Texas, and winning the first Tchaikovsky competition in Moscow in the flat-out heavy-duty Cold War. And you know, a lot of people don't know that name, Van Cliburn. In fact, the Cliburn competition is going on right now as we are yeah, so speaking. so fill me in. I don't yeah. know the name. Well, we're going to have a little talk afterwards. Okay. Van Cliburn, you look it up. Write it down in your notebook. <laughs> he was a boy from Texas whose mama, real to be, had taught him piano. And then mm. as he got in high school, he had a different teacher. And he came when the first Tchaikovsky Tchaikovsky competition was done, which I believe is 1958-59. And, of course, a boy from Texas wasn't going to win that, you see. This was just even having Westerners in Moscow in that point. We're talking serious political times then. Sure. You know? Be like going there now, kind of, okay? And everybody was just blown away by this kid. This tall Texas boy with his yes ma'am and no ma'am and saw and 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 the the story and it's real was that Khrushchev Khrushchev was asked what to do because he had out you know this wasn't what was supposed to happen and he said give it to the best player and Van Cliburn won mm. there were ticker tape parades in New York City when he came back I know people personally who as twelve year olds climbed to buildings to be able to see his car pass and this is often called the first. You know, chink or crack in the in the wall mm-hmm. of the Cold War, but of course it's through music, and and from the Tchaikovsky competition, which is a massively important competition every four years. Later, when Clyburn was an adult, started he started the Clyburn competition in Fort Worth, Texas, which runs an alternative two years, and it's expanded a lot. And people don't think about music competitions at all, but they have a lot of power at mm-hmm. points. They they have been uh, things that have woven people together internationally as well. I mean, look right now if you're following. I don't didn't plan on talking about the climber, but among the nine semifinalists right now um, is is a Ukrainian pianist who, and I mean, they're all spectacular players. Sure. But, you know, let's think about, you know, you, there's two Russians, one Ukrainian still in, in the running right now. Wow. And, 
you know, there's a lot of emotion around yeah. all that. Yep. You can imagine. Mm-hmm. And of course, the Russian played a, the Ukrainian played a, a partly Russian recital. Uh, I mean, sure. the, the, so music, music is not something that sits on a piano bench, and music is not something confined to a, to a classroom. You have to have training, but the implications of music are massive. So Clyburn is for all of you, and it was. I mean, from cover of Time magazine. And, and so he was a hero to me. And later, in later years, I got to work for the Clyburn organization for about 30 years and go to his house and eat his shrimp and look at it, you know. And, and the first time I ever saw a big DVD, which were those big ones, and sit up all night and watch Rosen Cavalier with his friend. I mean, you know, it, it's magical. Do you think I thought any of that would happen when I was 12? No. And you have dedicated your life to the fact that people like me, for instance, don't know who Van Clyburn mm. is, and there's something important about knowing who he is. What have you done to to do that work? What what have you? How conscious has it been to think kids are not hearing about Clyburn or music competitions? They need to participate in these things. What have you done to try to erase that gap? Well, anyone who knows me knows that I talk a lot. <laughs> <laughs> now, now, Paul. <laughs> Normally, I couldn't have gotten an award in with this panel. You were all being very. <laughs> nice we're about letting it. you set the table, and then I'm going to set the the you know the dogs on okay. you as it were. Set the dogs. Okay, but okay. The thing is, now I'm very conscious in what I'm doing. I will just practically attack someone, just like I did you right now. Yeah. Um, if if I'm on a plane and and somebody you know you talk about the Met having streaming opera service so that you can watch virtually anything, and they go, what's what's that mean? Then you know mm-hmm. that poor person sitting next to me, because I'm at a point in my life I get to do that. I'll never see that person again anyway. So that's my one shot. So I feel very conscious, like on a mission to pull up the flags. But on along the way, it's quite different. The arts, though, as you know, what people think about is so limited and so. Bad based on, on a narrow, superficial, um, instantly rewarding, so that the entire concept of what the arts have been historically and have meant dynastically and mean humanly is just floated off on a boat somewhere. So mm. I'd say I'm pretty conscious about it now. Yeah. Carol, can I ask a question? <laughs> yes. So um, you, you made the point that in prior years, we were not bombarded with the visual. Right, mm-hmm. so you might have your stained glass in your church, paintings in a home, something, but you're just not bombarded with the visual that we get today. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, plays you would see once in a blue moon, right, or operas. You wouldn't see these things. You couldn't sit down and watch something uh, visually fantastic, or or with regards to the sound, you couldn't turn on your speaker, you know, and listen to these fantastic performances every day. Mm-hmm. Um, what, what's the, you know, as we've, we've gone from the stage to the screen and from the live performance to the recorded performance, like, I mean, is there are, there are a lot of people out there that would say that those, that, that what art is now or the, the, the major form of art that our society participates in is film. Mm-hmm. So I, I'm curious, you know, where where you land on that? Would you, you know, our film buffs can they can they rival you and your your love for art, or are oh. they, you know, where, where, where do you where do you land on that? It's a complicated thing. It's a double edged sword, and when you sit on a double edged sword, it's sharp. You know, mm-hmm. you know, you have to bounce between the sides. I mean, film is a major art form that. People, I'm sure, 600 years earlier and 300 years earlier and 100 years earlier would have been thrilled to see existing. And like anything, it, it could be used for good or evil. And I'm not trying to go down that road right now, but let's let's just look at film. Film has its glorious moments. Film scores are a very mm. important form mm-hmm. of music. Um, it It is the way the European tradition continued in the world – uh, particularly after the 1920s, 1930s, when all the talent escaped if they were lucky, and many of them came to Hollywood and wrote the great film scores that taught the next generation, which is why you have a John Williams and why you have the score to E.T. Mm-hmm. and why you have, you know, the star. You wouldn't ha- that is an absolute line all the way back to Franz Liszt and Berlioz mm-hmm. and Beethoven and Brahms. And it's one of the ways you teach children about classical music, including video game music. Did you hear me say it like that? 
music mm-hmm, mm-hmm. because that's part of what attracts kids to those. To some of the a lot of great composers are working in that field because first of all, where do you work if you're a serious composer? That's its own mm-hmm. problem, and that's it's it you know. People, it's fun to do with kids. You take something that they're familiar with that has a good score and you turn down the sound and they find it all rather boring, you know? <laughs> so the power, again, of music with the visual. So there, the accessibility is marvelous. The fact that we could stop at lunch and we could pull up, you name the opera, you name the ballet, you name the play. We could pull up and we could compare 16 performances and decide what we liked. That is unbelievable, on the other hand, what's not happening is kids aren't putting little theaters in the backyard on a nice summer evening and doing their own mm. puppet version or silly version of some story that they've just read in the book, which would have been a normal kind of entertainment. Or they don't plan at Christmas time, like in those wonderful books that you read here yeah. in Memorial, like in a Moffat's or anything. They're not planning or in, in Little Women to, you know, the what will make the holiday special is when we do A, B, or C, where it's we act it out and we create. So the screen make children passive. You've got mm. to be very careful and you have to set it up, I think, so that when they watch something, they are watching with knowledge and background and understanding because everybody knows what happens to any of us. That glazed look we all get. So it's mm-hmm. a very potent form to be used for good or evil. So you said that the modern forms of art can sometimes, or at least TV or movies specifically, can make consumers out of us and make us passive what are the other causes that have you said that there's a chasm or a gap in our Mm -hmm. ability to appreciate the arts Mm -hmm. um is what other things have caused that what other things contribute to that gap well art takes time and it takes patience and it takes discipline and there was a time i'm not romanticizing this but People learn, for example, dance. They learned folk dance. If you were upper class, you learned court dance, ballroom dance. I mean, it was fairly, I, we had dance in school, you know, fourth grade. Oh, I mean, I, I agonized when I remember, you know, some of these kids, I still remember them. They're, I won't call their names, but, you know, <laughs> but actually they liked it, the boys. You know, they hated it, but they liked it. And mm-hmm. we learned basic waltz and basic, I don't know what we did, but I can remember holding their, their hands and they can probably remember holding ours, you know. But the point is you train children or they went to festivals. And you saw the teenagers dancing, and, you, and that's still true in many parts of the world. There's still an absolutely vibrant generational uh, flow of, of folk tradition, whether mm. it's craft, whether it's cuisine, and these are arts, by the way. You know, whether it's 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 um, making a saddle or making you know what it, weaving and de- um, everything that's decorative arts, which we also leave out of the paradigm, and that's some of the most vibrant form of the mm. art. And it flows through the generations. And grandma does this, but the little girls learn how to do this and the boys are making that and it's not gone everywhere in the world but it is gone out of our culture largely sure. so time discipline opportunity for training resources and those are very hard to replicate in the modern world mm. so i want to bring martin in here and by asking um are you a good dancer just kidding that wasn't was, my question but. Uh, well i was just thinking about that as a matter of fact <laughs> when she was talking because i, I was going to say something positive about this this whole role that dance has played in society. And then I'm sitting there thinking, but I can't dance. Uh, so, but you know, I mean, we're so, we're, we don't socialize like we used to mm-hmm. anymore. And these dances were great communal events where, where everyone got together and, and socialized and, 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 and talked and, it, and I, we just don't have anything like that anymore. Well, right? I, I think I'm going to get on Carol's good side here and say, let the the dancer at the table. I am not in your generation, Mm -hmm. and yet I met my wife dancing. How common do you think that is? Well, I'm I'm not saying that it's common. Actually, we've lamented for the past seven, eight years since we got married that our community, because the sewer company came in and bought the place where we danced as to tear it down and use it as a staging site, like the whole community just disappeared. But I mean, we were dancing multiple times a week together as like there was a group. I mean, it was 20, 30, 40, 50 of us. Mm-hmm. And, but those pockets exist. Now it's kind of moved that, it, that community's pockets, moved, but moved over to Southern you Indiana. Go, but you it's go. not, a, it's not a, it's not a culture wide thing. Mm-hmm. But if the people listening to this podcast, if you want it, it is out there. Mm-hmm. You right, say, I mean, it if, works. If you, you have to work harder you know, to find if you, it. If you went back 50 years, uh, and you went to a a, 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 a a city, not even a big one, on a Saturday night, there would be things going on st- 
numerous places. There'd be several big bands playing. I'm not, I'm sure there's not enough music, musicians anymore to make up oh, one there big band. Oh, there's plenty of musicians. They just, they don't, just don't get have the gigs. Yeah. And when they do, I mean, yeah. let me tell you, they swing. And yeah. you got to go back a little more than 50. But but you're getting close. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, and, there there was a, there were things going on. There was socializing and and it all, always seemed to involve the arts. Whether it was dance or whether it was music or whatever it was, there were things going on and now you know, you're lucky if there's one thing that goes on every couple of weeks, maybe every month, at the mm-hmm. arts center. You know, yeah. you got to go to the arts center to do uh-huh. that. You can't. Yeah. It's not. You in can't the backyard. experience it in a normal yeah. human situation. I don't know if you know where to look. I mean, I'm the saying, problem not, is you, I have to look. Okay, I didn't oh. used to have okay. to look. Okay, okay. That well, I, I don't either. I scroll on my phone. I'm like, oh, that's going on tonight. Let me, you know, like it, the. It's not something where you just walk down Main Street and you're going to find four or five things. What I'm saying is but, that we lived in a culture that once you could do that and you can't anymore. Well, so it's you have to go looking. You, just, you you don't just come on it naturally. But you do with sports. And again, I'm mm-hmm. not going – I mean, I, I'm a great lover of sports, okay? Uh, but you don't have to look to find sports in our culture. Wherever you go, it's on every TV set. You know, you see it. So well, you can, you can watch it. You but but, but if you, still you were in, also in Europe, you'd be participating in you are. It, even as an adult, whereas out here, that's not nearly as it's common. It's not as common, but it's still, you, it, it's front and center, and everybody's clear about the value of it. That's it. They're clear about why you yeah. put your seven-year-old in a soccer yeah. uh, uh, or football, as we should call it, European mm-hmm. football. Uh, you know, everyone's clear about why you would get a swimming lessons or why you would get um, even something more esoteric in the sports or, you know, um, turn it to tennis. Or, I said tennis already probably, but it doesn't matter. We don't have to explain to people why, if you can make that happen. But it's a good thing. You do have to explain why training in the arts, which also brings in a price point issue because mm-hmm. you don't have granddaddy or grandma and they're able to teach. It, it's just – it's fractured. It's fractured and it can be fixed, but it's going to be a struggle. Hmm. So speaking towards fixing the issue, the question I was going to ask you, Martin, is that when you guys assembled the Memorial College faculty – I know a part of it we talked about last time – was you were just finding interesting people and letting them be interesting for your classes. And I know that's part of why you asked Dr. Carroll to be a teacher. But it seems like there's something specific about her project that fits with what you guys are doing at the college. Well, yeah, this is interesting because we were, our our program is really based on, you know, on the great books program of the 50s and 60s. And Mortimer Adler and Robert Hutchins at the University of Chicago. And so they, they, came up with a, an actual program, the Great Ideas program, which our classes are really based on. And there wasn't, a, you know, of all the 10 volumes of that set uh, upon which our program is loosely based, there was nothing on music and the arts, you know. So this is a, this is a, this is a, a, a need that needed to be filled. And so I immediately thought of Carol because uh, she knows so much about these things and is so good at articulating them. And, and that's why we got her on is really to, to close a, a, a gap that we had in, in, in what was a traditional program, ironically, yeah. you know, that, that, those, those things were done and it probably wasn't done in the program like that back then because there was so much other stuff going well, on. Yeah. you got, you know, that, lots to do, you know. but, well, and of course, we won't give the backstory about me badgering him about the need for it, whether, no matter whom it involved. <laughs> you need to convince me. <laughs> well, no, not. And, but it is um, it is interesting because if you've got the great books, why do you have the, not have the great ballets, the great operas, the great symphonies, the great, you know, the masterworks of visual art, the great pieces of theater, mm-hmm. on and on, the, I don't, the great stained windows, as we were saying. Sure. So and you can't do it all. You can't have it all. You can't eat it all in one meal. But uh, watching it unfold with your uh, Memorial College students, because these are people that bring a lot to the table. Mm. They have, they've taught. They've raised their families. They've homeschooled. They've taught in classical institutions. They've, they've learned. They've taught themselves a lot, and they, they've read just oodles of great stuff. And then what's exciting is, and this has happened multiple times, having them say, now that I've got this chunk of mus- things musical, I realized that was talked about 27 times in that novel that we just did in mm-hmm, so-and-so class. Mm-hmm. Because of course it was because the arts were integrated into daily life and have always been until recently. Well, you look at something like um, like Anna Karenina, say, that's the Take Tolstoy, and they're going to plays, they're going to dance, and a lot of, Things key off of those events, those mm-hmm. dances, and in fact, when they made the the movie Anna Karenina, which I have a lot of problems with, the di- but they made that dance scene rather central, mm-hmm. and it was a beautiful thing to watch, mm-hmm. really. Uh, uh, and um, and and so it it really is true mm-hmm. because most of the great 
works, most of the great novels, were written at a time when this was part of life. So, Dr. Carroll, part of your project of rectifying some of these issues has come about with these books that you've written and put together for us. So talk about these books. So we brought down Haran Hallelujah, which is a collection of traditional songs. And then we also brought down Discovering Music, which speaks to that issue we were just talking about. And that is, this is helping to lay that foundation for students or for people who want to be more literate culturally about the arts, right? Yes. So yes. tell me how it does that specifically. Okay. Well, Discovering Music, we, we created that in 2009, and this is a new edition. And so it's actually a course that I teach in DVD lectures and also online, et cetera. It's, but, and then it's backed up with the narrative and student work and drills and all the things you need if it's a course, right? But a lot of adults do it and just ignore all those academic sides of it and just sure. take the content. But it is a basically a traditional, what you would call maybe a freshman college music arts appreciation course um, in terms of its approach. It's a very, people say, oh, how'd you come up with that? And I say, well, I didn't come up with it. It's been around, you know, mm. for however many hundred years. That's just how you teach basically the arts is these different variations. But we started with that in 2009 after having discovered, as it was, the homeschool market, which I discovered through students at SMU mm. who were my among my most clever, let's just put that way, that were homeschooled and made me aware of such a thing as homeschooling, which I'd never heard of. And they were the ones that made me aware of the need for secondary and adult materials. And then we went to our first conference in 2008. I stumbled right into the Memoria booth and saw what was there, which blew me away because I had no idea that, remember, I'm in academia, I'm in a university. Sure. You think all this is gone Except it wasn't. There it was. And so at any rate, that there's a long link here mm. with you all. It goes, it's very important to me. But at any rate, Discovering Music covers from 1600 to the First World War. So about 1918, we stop about 1920. And we have amplified that by going back with something called Early Sacred Music, which goes up to right. 1400, which is a... And we've been able to do more and more on location. I've pulled in everybody I can think of, colleagues, friends, former students, those 18-year-olds, those 22-year-olds, one I'm thinking of, who who's now a colonel in the military uh, working up at the White House with the band, you know, but he wasn't when I knew him, you sure. see. Or someone who's singing in Covent Garden or at the Met or conducting uh, at the Detroit Symphony, but they were 19 when I knew them. Sure. Uh, the young lady that's doing the emceeing for the Clyburn right now mm. and the pianist that I remember very much as a 19-year-old. So, I mean, the, the, you've got, if you teach a long time, all of you all know this, you look at these people, they're not 19, they're 26, they're 46, you know, and they're doing these great things. So, And then archaeologists and historians and monks and um, ethnomusicologists and dancers. So we pull everybody into the courses and we've been able to film on location a lot. And so it becomes colorful because what you're trying to replicate is what Martin was talking about, a, a sense of what it was to have the arts around. Sure. Uh, so that's kind of where the courses go. Is it a blend of theory and history and exposure and all of the above? Or All but theory. We have a theory course. Okay. Theory, I mean, theory might be implied occasionally, but it's it's you can't take the weave of the arts apart. Mm. So I call it teaching history and culture through the lens of the fine arts. Um, that's a slogan, you see. But, but it's also true. If you could look at every, I mean, you can look at science through the lens of the fine arts. How can you compose a painting? Do you think anybody doing tapestries in the media Evil wasn't using mathematics to set all of that out on the cartoon that they use. How can you do an, make an instrument without acoustics? You sure. know, without without the physical sciences. So the sciences. I'd love to teach an entire science course based strictly through the arts. Choreography is based on physi physiognomy, physiology, all those things, plus geometry, plus lighting. I mean, all of it is science, and that's the thing people don't know. Uh, and why would they know? Because they haven't seen it or experienced it. Um, you you better have some pretty smart cookies doing the creative arts and high level performances because these are high level thinkers with with really intense understanding of what we would call science and technology of every sure. era. Not to mention the visual design, costumes, seams. There's so much that goes into say an opera. It's just stunning, mm. and people go, oh. I don't like opera. And, you know, all I know is <laughs> if I can dump that person, just put a bag over their head, dump them in the middle backstage of the Met at a, at a, anything from the very first sits pro rehearsals where they're just looking to do the score to final dress, they are going to come out with eyes like this. At any 10 minutes of that would do it. I do think that would be an important, be a great experiment, but I would urge you not to abduct anyone. 
<laughs> well, no, no one we know, right? <laughs> <laughs> Even someone you don't volunteers know. volunteers out there. <laughs> <laughs> so, Paul, Dr. Carroll has been giving us kind of this vision for what it could be like to educate a student in music and the arts. You've kind of been our exemplar on this podcast before of someone who had a classical education. What was your upbringing like in terms of relating to the arts? What were the deficiencies and what were the positives? Because I think you'll kind of give a sense of what most people experienced and where do you kind of wish that you had some of this? Well, you may be wrong in your assumptions okay. here because I'm over here struggling. I'm still stuck on our previous conversation about where where to find the arts because like I'm sitting here going like this, this has been all around me my whole life. Okay. So like I remember sitting in a classroom when I was in seventh grade and just like paging through beautiful paintings. Like it was just, it was like a card deck that was just sitting there in the classroom and I had time. So I went and grabbed it and I was just like enthralled with the paintings. Right. And like in, in high school, when we would we would occasionally be watching performances and we'd be watching explanations of these performances it was like professor carroll's uh videos without the great production and the the engaging speaker um in some ways right i mean it was it was kind of a hodgepodge together definitely not production quality but it was you know it when you start listening to those things again and again and again and even like even though i didn't feel like i got the Nobody sat me down and walked me through it all. It was bits and pieces that I was getting. All, but th but that's the way culture that I'm hearing the older folks in the room talk about how it used to be. This was just part of culture. You get bits and pieces here, and all of a sudden you're kind of weaving this all together. And you're like, oh, this is this is amazing, right? Um, you know, uh, not frequent, but but regular visits to museums, beautiful places, um, beautiful churches. Um, and understanding the historical context of where those things are coming from, um, art history course in college, all that stuff that, um, you know, and participating in choir and band for mm. God off a long time. What was your um, instrument? Trumpet. I was Go told band. it was the easiest. They were wrong. But. Um, I played trumpet for many, several, uh, I don't know, was that four or six, eight, I don't know, something like that years. And, um, you know, so, so I, 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 I sit here and I do appreciate going to an opera, going to a musical. Um, part of that also is a language study too. Like, because I have the Italian to sit there and watch, you know, an opera that's in Italian, where it's, it's really nice when they got the screens with the, with the English. So I don't have to be struggling to completely understand because singing and speaking is two different things. Sure. Um, but but I I there's that's a that's a huge bridge to, to me feeling comfortable in that that arena, um, and so like the, I've been I was given a lot of things that you know I, I do have that appreciation I do spend the money to go you know actually look at a performance I, I can't watch an opera on on screen I need the whole thing right and I have been backstage and it's absolutely astounding um like what carol was talking about but it's it's just a you know like it's if if you're not exposed to that i mean i remember going to the nutcracker as a kid mm. right and once it wasn't every year but you know those things are transformative into okay what do you appreciate right um and so you know as my wife and i occasionally like we've we've my wife is a much better artist. She paints, she plays piano, you know, and those are things that have always been important to her. And so I'm like, hun, this, we, I, I did this a few months ago. I said, I want to paint. I can't, I can't paint worth beans. And I said, let's just, let's just get out Bob Ross. Cause it's a place for me to start and we'll get a canvas and we'll paint. And honestly, we didn't have the right tools. We didn't have, you know, I had to stop about halfway through Bob Ross because he was going too fast for me, but it was a start. Then we went and got bigger canvases and now we're just waiting for a day to sit there and do it again, you know? And, and I'm, but what I'm learning from Bob Ross is not to imitate him, but the techniques of how to do it so that I can do it myself. Um, and so, you know, it's, it's the small things, but that, that is an appreciation. And I, we, I want to talk about that word. You mentioned that word before we started. I want to talk about the word appreciation, but I have 
an appreciation for those things because of all those bits and pieces that I was given in school at home. Um, and just in my, you know, what I was forced to be around as a kid. So sadly, because you did receive a classical education, you're once again, totally unrelatable. <laughs> Correct. <laughs> <laughs> and, and you know, and I, and I'm very happy to be unrelatable. Yeah. Yeah. Great. <laughs> No, it's- you know, but but that's but that's why I struggle. Like I, I still want. I like I would love to dig deeper into this. Like I the, about where do you find dance? Well, the reality is those people are do, like the people watching the film and in some way are participating in art, but they're doing it in their own home and not in a communal area, right? Mm-hmm. So in some sense, like as humans, we are tied to the arts. No matter we can't get away from it. Right. We can't get away from it. But how do we do that communally? I think is a, is a great question because I don't have an answer to that. Yeah, well, we do it communally by participating in it. I mean, I think you know, I, I agree with a lot of what you say, but it's all you're you're a spectator. You know, when uh, I really love the the PBS documentary on country music that uh, uh, I forget his name who did that that yeah. Civil War series. Um, yes, Ken Burns. Uh, Ken Burns, and um, and it you know talked about this art form that came out of uh, of these rural areas. And it was people, people just got together on their porches and they sang and they played and they, they were participating in it themselves. And I, I think what we're, what's happening right now is we're, we're, in a, we're in a mode of sort of reconstruction and we're having mm-hmm. to start with just being familiar with it and watching it and hearing it and, and being a spectator. That's where it's got to start, you know, so that you can get interested enough in it to start doing it yourself. But but what I was lamenting was the fact that it was a much more org- organic part of culture at some point, yeah. the, the arts were. But uh, I completely agree with a lot of what you're saying, right? This We need to participate in it. But I, what's the difference between sitting there and watching an opera in an opera house or going to a play and watching Shakespeare and sitting down and watching a film other than the fact that in well, an opera think, you would think, have shouted bravo. I think opera and drama is a different thing because that's that's something you go to that's that's something you go to watch. Very few people participate in that, but they go but I'm talking about I'm talking about these, you know, music and painting and you know things that, you know, I, I you got to go to museums now to see a lot of things that were being, you know, what happened to the local painter, you know, that, that w- was in your town or the, you know, you, it was just much more real. So I'm not, uh, in terms of, of, of visual art, it's probably more of a spectator thing, obviously, because. Okay. It, that's a helpful distinction. Availability. I mean, it, partly that's why you have the songbook here. That's partly why we made Hurrah and Hallelujah, um, because everybody's in the attic. If you've got an attic and you've got great Aunt Mary stuff or great, great Aunt whatever. You've got songbooks up there. Almost definitely. Everybody had songbooks and they're all falling apart. And that's what led us to do. And and I happen to have this thing I was going to show you to, to link to that. But before I do, if I may, when I grew up, my mother was from New York. So we listened to the Met radio broadcast when we ironed and folded clothes on Saturday. That's what you did. And musicals, every time the Rodgers and Hammerstein, and musicals are operas. That's a whole different conversation. It's just they're in English and they have spoken dialogue. but uh, Or they can be in French with spoken dialogue or German with spoken dialogue. But the point being, when those things came out, they came to films. My mother couldn't put us on a train and go up to New York City to see them come to Broadway, you know. But we were able to watch those wonderful movies. And our household, when they, weeks, months before, before we were excited and they would be on the radio we bought LPs and my mother would sing all those songs and she would sing Verity songs because she loved that music my father's out on the back porch listening to playing he was a guitarist hillbilly guitarist West Virginia thank you playing Jimmy Rogers and so what would he do on Saturday night what you were saying normal he'd sit out there on the picnic table always on top of the picnic table I guess it's really most comfortable <laughs> and wait to see which neighbor would come over with which instrument and it might be <laughs> Mr. Booth with his I think it was probably banjo that he brought I can't remember and it would be someone from down the street and Mr. Terman might come over and people would sing that's and we were just regular not by any means elite okay but that's what happened it was sad just what you're saying and of course in you get into pockets of in villages and and you see that now you go to Croatia you're on the island of of Var and you you know you you go on Sunday afternoon and people are sitting in the cafes and the kids are running around and motorcycles are little cute motorcycles are flying around and the dogs are running and people are sitting over here singing these songs and somebody else is doing reading a book or crossword puzzle singing these songs and it's 
just still not gone, but we don't get to have it. You've talked about kind of this double-edged sword of kind of the modern culture of art. And I think you have the same thing with YouTube and Reddit and the subreddit. Coming to Paul's point, there there is communities for, for dancing out there. There are communities for everything out there. And my generation knows that. But what, what happens with that is that because you're not in your home and that's the only thing you have is your family and your parents. Now you can go, you can get away from your family and their particular interests or their, you know, shared influences. And you can go find the people that you have interest with. And so it becomes very granular and very focused and you don't have the well-roundedness of, this is all we have is picking up the guitar and playing a song here. And I've got to learn what the songs of mom and dad like, and I've got to learn what the neighbors like. And it creates a shared experience. Now you can silo yourself off and have this very granular, unique experience. Yeah, so it, it there's happens. a community for this. There's a community for, right. for that. But what about the community right. that you're in? So it goes back to Dr. Carroll's word earlier that she said that is it's fractured. Hmm. And so there, you know, it's, there, in all angles of this conversation, there are issues that prevent kind of this view, this uh, vision that you have of us having shared experiences with the arts um, and participating in them and appreciating them together. And is it a spice or is it a basic food group? Mm. There you go. You know. And can I make yeah. one more point in regard to what you just said is that we get together and we read literature. Yes. And we read philosophy sometimes. And we, and, and, well, we don't get together to play music. Mm -hmm. We don't get together to do any artistic thing. And, you know, and even what we do is rare, mm -hmm. really. But but uh, I, I just thought it was interesting that, that we, uh, I, I don't bring my banjo to, to our meetings. Uh, I, I'm, I'm waiting theme. for the next meeting. I, I can't <laughs> wait now. Well, and, and, and Every meeting needs a banjo. Growing up, I had friends who would. We, they would get together to play music, and I would mm -hmm. occasionally go. I was never a very talented musician, so I dropped out pretty early, unfortunately. But... I wish I was a more talented musician because that was a really fun thing that they got to do together. And that speaks to if, if more students, you know, I was in you know band all the way to 12th grade, played piano, all the things, but unless it's a, an expectation that you're going to reach a level of competency, you're, you're not able to participate in that thing for life. Yeah. Same is true with sports, except for with sports, you get that message from the beginning. Like <laughs> if you want to take basketball with you the rest of your life, you've got to get a, to a certain level of competency or else you're embarrassed yourself when you get on the court. Well, but you can get on a court and, and you know, in the pickup games in a park, yeah, right? Well, and I think yeah. that's the thing is we're not we're not having the pickup bands in the park anymore. Well, we have like the pickup that. basketball games uh, in the we park. We have fewer of those too, unfortunately. Well, we do, I, but there's, they noticed. still exist. It's not to say that you can't Now that you live in the city, you'll see it more. Not that you can't <laughs> overcome that deficit. It's that it's it's a it's harder if you don't start earlier. And so it just increases the, the on-ramp, the difficulty of the on-ramp. See, adults are always apologizing that they only had two years of piano or they only played trumpet in the band for a year. And I'm saying, hallelujah that you played trumpet in the band for a year because you learned. That's the another thing. I, I, I do this when I'm in, with my groups especially. People are people who you know are highly successful, older people that own hotel change, maybe, whatever. And they're saying, well, I only was in choir for three years. And I want to say... You were in choir for three years. This is critical. I'm so glad. But it's, it's funny because we we don't need any more first violinists. We don't need any more prima ballerinas. We don't. We got all those people. What you need is people in the seats. You need people who understand and value. And so you, what you just said is pretty doggone wonderful, <laughs> you see. And you did do those things. And you understand from doing it. And I'm not saying, oh, let's just all dabble. But dabbling is an important thing, sure. too. We do that with many other things. Um, it adds value. Value. One year of trumpet in seventh grade band is very important. Sure. And, and does that go to your thing about appreciation? I'm really curious. Yeah. Was, okay. Yeah. Be, because. All right. Are you saying that by by appreciating, we at least are going to start encouraging the culture to to well, engage does, more in the does arts? There need to be an audience for it, right? It and, does. There I mean, does. I, yeah, you know, like, <clears throat> local theaters. You know, we have a local theater in Danville, Pioneer Playhouse, where John Travolta got his start. Um, oh yes, it's going. Robbie Henson, uh, uh, Eben Henson started. Robbie Henson, who's a director, uh, directed Pharaoh's Army, great little film. Um, but they're always struggling they're financially oh, yeah. and to get people in the seats. And and so I do think that's that's where we have to start. Is just develop, <laughs> try to develop some sort of uh, audience for this, so that there will be more of it. That's definitely true. Um, the word appreciation is loaded to me because it 
it makes it optional. Mm. Mm. You know, you didn't, did we talk about oysters earlier? Was that a different conversation? We don't go back into that one. But you know, raw oysters, not everybody, you could, maybe you do or don't appreciate raw oysters, but it's certainly not in- intrinsic to your daily life, right? And appreciation, I mean, it, it was just a normal world. And maybe it is a neutral word, but it becomes optional. It, it, well, it, it, if you choose to learn, and it doesn't saying this is oxygen, this is the soil that grows our food, you know. This yeah, you're is the, thinking of music, the music appreciation class, which is sort of the optional thing that you could take. The elective. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you think it's going to be easy till you get in there and then you're slammed, you know, like with an art. But, but so that part of it. You know, that's part of my so, problem. So, that so you love that when people appreciate the arts, well, prize it. It means but, prizing it, right? right? But you don't want you don't want that connotation of appreciation is an elective in school, or it's just a taste. You know, you you have a taste for music, or you don't have a taste. It's it, fine. It, it, and you're it, saying that that you reject that approach. I want to brawl with the arts. So. <laughs> <laughs> And that's what needs to happen. And you need to have, you need to survive your kid trying to learn how to make a sound out of a trumpet, which is not easy, right? And you need to learn how to survive all of these things, and not because you're going to become a professional, but the process, which we understand in sports and generally as a society appreciate, the process is invisible to many, many people. Not everybody here, but we are not necessarily everybody, okay? So on this podcast, we're constantly saying things like everyone should read an uh, ancient language and read ancient books and read the Iliad and Odyssey. And these are things that you should do. And they're, you know, if you say it's not for me, well, you're wrong because it's <laughs> uh-huh. for everyone. And you're saying the same thing about music. And there's a certain kind of person who hears that and says, I'm just not a music person. Uh-huh. What do you say to that person? Well, and only because I'm sitting here looking at it. Uh, and, and that touched the issue of us not being a singing culture anymore. And that's a whole other beef with me, you know, because the Americans, oh, I can't sing. I can't sing. You know, we're terrified to sing. Much of the rest of the world just sings. Every child sings. Before they speak, they sing. They sing until some adult shuts them down, and that's fact. But I would say to that person, you need these songs. Mm-hmm. You need you need songs. We love songs. People say, I don't know any songs, but they know a lot of songs in their mind. And of course, then I would say you need the folk tradition, and not just folk. Uh, traditional song repertoire is a glue for the culture. And when we no longer have it, when people no longer can laugh as kids of who put the overalls in Mrs. Murphy's chowder, or when they no longer know um, down by the old mill stream, you'd say, oh, those are really old. Yes, but they still, they teach melody, they teach balance, they teach vocabulary, they teach harmony, they teach communal um, beauty, they teach imagery, they teach poetry, they teach, and we could go on and on and on. They're fun, they're whatever. Um, that then that's I think often where you you need to tell people we're not talking about whether you like the Brahms um, piano concerto we're talking about whether you like to have the joy of a song in your heart you know and that that's something I think you, you this idea of arts being elite which is why they're not available which is why you don't have people in the seats either they think there's going to be something elite that's going to happen it's going to be hard and it's not going to be any fun you know when in fact it's simply not. True, but I, I'm, I'm babbling on a bunch of different directions here. Uh, what should I say next? Yeah, so <laughs> should, I, should I show you this? Which is what yeah, I wanted. Well, I wanted to, to, I wanted okay. to end on I, that. I brought because, this book I wanted to show you. See, because you Can brought you in the, the traditional songs, uh-huh. and you brought the book of poems, and I just thought it would be great to end just with you explaining why that book of poetry kind of goes with this book of songs. Well, okay, and and again, let's back up. Nursery rhymes were very much. People are pretty much on board. They may not understand how valuable. A lot of people think it's just something you do for kids. Nursery rhymes are the, are the basic big Legos, not the little ones, you know, the ones you give, whatever. They're the building. They're, they're Without nursery rhymes, you don't develop which ten, which hundred things do we want to talk about that, don't, that come from nursery rhymes in every culture, okay? And so then, you know, your next step, your next step, your next step. But so when I was seven, I, it, this is not the one my mother got me. It's called 1,000 Points for Children um, by it, it, the main ver- uh, Elizabeth Hugh uh, Seacrest was this particular edition. I think it started about 1935. There were several editions. This is the 1946. Mine is in shambles, although I did color this nice picture, you see. Um, yeah, so it's except like not this one. This is a, 
Yeah, can you, I can tell you what colors I made everything, and I would, and I got in trouble for that. I can tell you that too. But my mine has to be held together with a rubber band. I buy them when I find them. I shouldn't even tell you all this because now there'll be no more on eBay. <laughs> Get them before I get them, okay? But the point is, this book was my best friend growing up. We didn't have the whole stretch of literature that you all have here at Memorial Press. I had golden books. I had whatever was read to me. I, I don't remember having, and we went to the library, okay? So the beautiful thing about this book is it's gradated, as all things are, you know, so it starts with points for the nursery, and you had these little drawings, just a few pen and ink drawings. Remember, we have all these fabulous illustrations now, but kids didn't used to have 700 pictures in a book. They had this owl. You know, and I can remember spending hours looking at every illustration. And I had a sense that as I got into the bigger poems, poems for the holidays, and then poems, poems that sing, and then poems and songs and verse, and then you end up poems of patriotism and poems of the season, and you end up with humorous and reverence, and then the epics that get you ready to be doing the things you all do here with Horatius at the Bridge or whatever, or the Charge of the Light Brigade. Well, anyway, this this never left me. And it was, I remember cry, when I would get upset, when I would cry. My point being, what, what a child has at age seven, 19, you know, is important. I think the key age is seven and 11, 12, 10, 11, 12. Those are key ages. So at any rate, when we decided we want to make a songbook, that was my model, my granddaughter, Patty, who was then, I don't know what she was, six or so, did the title, Hurrah and Hallelujah. I could never be that clever. But, you know, I would have said a hundred traditional songs, but Hurrah <laughs> and Hallelujah. So what I did, and I, ta- I and, and we tried to do the same thing. I tried to do it with songs from bygone days. days. And, and, you know, I'm not saying this is the best way to do it. And we had these little drawings, you know. I'm sorry, I'm still excited about this. So we have little drawings, you see. Um, and the point being... Now, you know, I'm seven. I'm a lot more than seven. And this kind of planting, whatever it be, whatever it be, you hear a, a brass court, you hear a Capitol Bones in their, you know, trombone ensemble. You hear, you go to a play in the park and it's Shakespeare. You go to a craft fair and you see someone blow glass or make a mosaic and you're seven. You see, I don't care what they are for. You go to a, watch someone, you know, make quiches and, and, and culinary arts. You go watch someone weave in a craft fair. What a kid sees at these early ages sticks, and it becomes something that is their friend, and it grows, and it develops. And they may find as an adult what they have is a whole vocabulary of color and sound and content that without the arts, they would not have. Well, Dr. Carroll, I'm inspired. Thank you for letting me say these things. Yeah, thanks for for being on. We appreciate it. Thank you for listening to today's episode of Classical Etc. If you'd like to show your support for the show, then you can leave a like below. If you'd like to add your voice to the conversation, then you can comment. And if you want to follow along with us on this journey, then please subscribe. Thanks, and I'll see you later.